Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Rights and Democracy Television, uh, our monthly show where we uh, exhibit most of what we've been up to with Rights and Democracy in the past month. Um, we have a couple of uh, guests with us today, a couple more than usual, um, three, which is great. Um, first to my left is Jeffrey Caesar. Um, and then uh, our next guest over, um, I just met tonight, and I'd like yeah. him to tell uh, yeah, if himself. Yeah, if Nar Avalix Stratibus. Okay, thank you. Yep. Right. And then and then we have Charles Simpson on the end. Um, so we have a couple of people that have uh, been involved with some events that we've been doing in the past month. Um, first of all, we'd like to talk about our uh, fair development panel that we put on last night, where we exhibited a a report that. Um, that really helps rights and democracy get involved with development in, in each community in a different way than uh, people have experienced maybe in the past. Um, and so first I'd just like to talk to everybody about what they, what they felt about that, uh, that panel, the discussion, and, uh, and the report that we put out because we, we seem to come up with a lot of good ideas after, after we exhibited our report in the panel. So. Um, I guess we'll just go right across the board here. Jeffrey, can we start with you? How are you doing today? I'm doing well. It's good to meet you. All right. Great, great. Yeah, so uh, I, I thought the panel was a great success for on multiple levels. Uh, to begin, the panel was, it, it happened to coincide with another event that was uh, happening in, uh, with a lot of people that are in favor of the current development uh, that is potentially going to take place downtown. Uh, and because of that, I think there was that enabled a stronger discourse uh, that is that that has been unheard uh, for the majority of, uh, of of the issue. The when when rights and democracy presented the actual issues in the platform, uh, it took shape of a, uh, a toolkit that can be used in future development pro uh, in future development uh, projects. Uh, that took a direct look into the issues that we were presented with in this current downtown development project, and so it was very, it was a great co cross section of two, you know, poignant things that we need to address in in Burlington, and so uh, my my perspective definitely is that is one that would send that that resonated with you know the different voices of the panel. It was, it was a very diverse panel, but one of the common themes that went throughout uh, all of their feedback and all of their considerations was the need for inclusion. And in the development project as it currently exists has not been inclusive, which many of us are very aware of, uh, but it's under the guise of, you know, being, of, of having, you know, included the, com the community's perspective, which is not true. The, in addition to that, they, w I do think that there could have been more of a discourse for uh, uh, some of the environmental impacts. The conversation took much more of a social and economic overtone, uh, but there could have been more conversation regarding the wastewater uh, issues that would that would deal with the uh, the sewage outflow systems that will be retrofitted next. Yeah, all right, all right. Uh, Charles, he's okay. passing the ball to me. Okay. Passing the ball right now. All right. Yeah. Well, I I was I was pleased. We got the. Uh, we got the study just at the time of the event, so we didn't really have a chance to look it over, but I've looked it over since. And I mean, there's a lot of rich material here. One of, one of the interesting points I will bring up is that the return of these two streets has been a center of the conversation. This, this is really what uh, caused local motion to support the project. And, uh, but what you've done here is, I think, make a, ver a very important point that uh, Coalition for a Livable City has been making. And I'm, member of the Coalition for Livable City, CLC. And that's that the, um, the developer needs these roadways to make the project feasible. This is his storefronts. This is his office windows. This is his residential window. You can't have a residence without a window. So, uh, you know, you make a lot of these points. And, and if, it, if we need to share the benefit, well, you know, we can certainly go back to uh, whatever the... Uh, uh, the initial uh, mall developer paid back in the 1980s and, and, and say, okay, we'll, we'll pay you the same amount for these same, same streets. So mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, 
I, I appreciate this, this document, and I, I think it's, uh, it's food for thought and uh, a good way to lay out the discussion. Yeah, yeah. And then the, uh, the panel, uh, the, the people I think the panel, the panel was well balanced. Uh, okay. I thought that uh, we had a former CETO person, we had a, a CLC person, we had a couple of other activists and a member of the uh, city council. So that was, that was good. I would just throw in one sort of one other sort of larger uh, framework for this. Back in the eighteen in the nineteen nineteen eighty five, a sociologist named uh, Harvey Molach wrote a book called Urban Futures, Urban Fortunes, and basically he he analyzed the city as a growth machine, and he argued that a various uh, interests come together to promote growth at any, any kind of growth because growth adds to the, the value of, of certain kinds of lands, the adjacent land to, to, to developments and uh, uh, certainly the, the folks who are selling newspaper ads or selling concrete or whatever, you know, will, will benefit from this. So it's a, there's this inner dynamic of all cities to grow and it, it needs to be looked at, I think, critically because there's other values than simply increasing real estate uh, values and tax rates and, and profits for particular developers. And maybe Burlington has some different values than other uh, cities and, and towns. One, and one likes to think that, yes. Mm -hmm. um, Igmar? Yeah. Uh, so what I really like to hear from Bruce Seifer and Selena Colburn uh, they talked about our neighborhood planning assemblies. And these are places that people can come to and have very vibrant discussions. You know, it it's, includes all people, whoever you are, whatever you are. If you're a person, you live in Burlington, <laughs> go to your neighborhood planning assembly meetings and get into these debates. They've, they've been getting more fiery, more interesting, and some of them have dinners you can, you can go to and, and socialize before the meeting. And so the idea last night is that this is the place to have discussions, bring your neighbors in, and get to know the issues because our city councilors are spinning things in one direction, the one direction they're promoting this project. And here we are, here, okay. here I am in this room, <laughs> and I'm unable to say whether or not I'm voting on the ballot items, right. uh, three and four. But yeah. they, can, they can say that they can encourage people to vote yes on three and four. But I'm right. unable to say what I want to encourage right. voters to vote on. on right. So I think that's, that's uh, totally unfair. Takes a, Undemocratic. So. That's, that's a very, very good point to make. I like it. I like it very much. And, um, and so we've noticed that, that the, um, the plan in Burlington to redevelopment our, our town center has been a big, a big kind of problem, a kind of maybe even a thorn in the side of the... Um, the mayor of the city council of the developer of a lot of the people in Burlington um, a lot of people are really for the project because it uh, it will manage a uh, you know a, a hundred percent of its stormwater waste um, but that doesn't speak to its um, it's the waste that it develops from the population that lives there and uses all the stores and everything um, it, it speaks to it it's it's got a it's got a, pr a part of their project that's going to involve waste heat from the, the local uh, energy uh, generation plant that's going to use that waste heat to heat the whole area. So it's, a, it's part of a, a really cons conservation effort to, to save on how, how heat is, is managed in the district. And so um, a lot of people are saying that there's, a, and, and, and there's some affordable housing, there's some, uh, there's, some, and there's some housing for some college students up there. Um, and, and a lot of people are saying that all of these things are the, the kind of the, the big, pro, the, the good things about the project. And I think that uh, still maybe that there's some other opinions that haven't been, um, haven't been uh, you know, recognized in that effort too. Um, do, do you guys have anything to uh, I can add barely to that? contain myself, but I'll take my, I'll wait my turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'd like to just kind of go down the, yeah. down the line and see what you guys think about that. Yeah, thank you, absolutely. And uh, w with that, so I'm, I'm the founder of Live Smart Solutions. It's a, a sustainability business and living consulting firm. And coming from a background of sustainable development, 
it's a very interesting topic because it's what is sustainable to some is not is not true sustainability, and uh, that is a fundamental flaw with this program, uh, with with the project that it's that as it is in going forward, uh, without community input. Uh, what the side of the developers are seeing as sustainability is purely economic, uh, and economic from the standpoint of big business coming in and flourishing. That is a dynamic that has been it's been rampant throughout our country for you know since since the inception of America, um, definitely since the Industrial Revolution. But it's not one that is actually sustainable. But that is what our system is entrenched in. Uh, we live in a very corporate capitalist regime, and that's how things. That that, that that's the major driver behind a lot of uh, a lot of the development that happens here, not just in the U.S., but how we go into other countries and attempt to develop them. It's incorrect and it has a lot of negative external consequences. Uh, when you come into a community, especially as these outside developers that are coming from New York with a lot of money, they're coming into Vermont because they see, in Burlington specifically, because they see the potential, the raw potential. This area uh, has cultivated for so long a culture of sustainability, of uh, inclusion for the most part, of uh, you know taking care of the environment in a way that is wholly different from any other place that I have seen in America. Uh, as someone that is new to Vermont, uh, there is so much here uh, that there, there's so many elements of sustainability down to the very understanding, uh, to, to, to the very way that each individual lives their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, going into a store or a restaurant and knowing that they have to compost their material, which limits the, which, which limits, li limits the organic waste going into our landfills, that's phenomenal. That's not something they do back home uh, universally. Uh, and that's you know, one small example. These elements are there that, that, that you know, the culture here is built upon, it reflects very much in the surrounding. Uh, you can go out on Lake Champlain. There, there's no view. Uh, I've, I've never seen a view like Lake Champlain. Uh, the Adirondacks in the back, and this is highly marketable. And that's what they're doing. They would, like, why would they come here to build a high rise? It, I, it's convenient that there's a lack of space uh, outside of Burling, uh, in and around Burlington to keep developing outwards. And when it comes to conserving space, I am a fan of building up, but I am not a fan of building up in the way that they're doing it. It's 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 literally selling out this space, the like, culture and the values. Maybe not listening to the uh, the public completely. Absolutely. Yeah. Right on. Well, thank thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I agree, Jeffrey. Yeah. Um, Plan B TV has a whole paragraph about building within the permissible envelope. The current building envelope that we have allows buildings to go up in the downtown core to. Ten floors. Could you, uh, could you tell everybody what Plan B TV is? Um, Plan B TV. Is, uh, it was a two and a half year process. Uh, citizens were engaged in with workshops um, and sort of little teach-ins and then discussions and sketch sessions of what people's uh, dreams and views of what the city might look like. And so there was a lot of community gardens and solar panels and windmills and playgrounds and bike paths, you know, protected bike lanes and, yeah. and all this kind of stuff. But somehow coming out of that, we're seeing, let's do a tall building. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I wanted to respond to the, the wastewater uh, element mm -hmm. of this project. I, okay, yeah. the, that's one, what's talked about is the stormwater and, and catching all the stormwater, and that would be beneficial more than what's there, apparently. It's, uh, it can be improved. But what's ignored is um, whenever someone mentions um, um, several times, um, what about wastewater? Yeah. The, um, Wastewater treatment plant, the last time it was upgraded, was in like 80-something. And it, every 15, 20-something years, it, it, it gets upgraded. I went on a tour of the plant, and I recommend you all find the time where there's a tour to go on it. It's overdue for an upgrade, and we're going to be dumping all this wastewater into the, into the plant. And what happens when we have the storm events is we've got now a fuller bucket of our miraculous um, processed um, meals, et cetera. To, to try to manage. And it's going to be going into the lake. So there's some yeah. people saying, what are you talking about? It's going to be. So I'm extremely surprised that uh, 
the Conservation Law Foundation has apparently oh. endorsed this. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I'm really, apparently this Kool-Aid, as people have been saying, is very <laughs> strong. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I look forward to a meeting with the Conservation Law Foundation to have a discussion about what they are seeing as beneficial in this because uh, I, I don't see this as something that's, um, that's going to be good for the lake. That's fantastic to hear. It's really good to know that people in the community are, are involved with everybody, um, with all the decision makers as well, right? Because this is a very influential group and, and people need to just kind of pay attention and be active, right? Um, that's part of what Rights and Democracy is trying to work towards locally with uh, get, you know, the political revolution is getting people involved. So, um, you know, that's the same type of thing is just being involved in your community. You don't have to necessarily be going out and, and voting for uh, your president to, uh, to be involved with what's going on. Um, Charles, did you... Uh, yeah, treat, uh, treatment of wastewater is interesting because it's sort of a, it's iconic for ecology and ecology tells us everything is a closed system. And of course the same lake that we dump our waste into is the lake that we draw our drinking water from. So it's really, you know, the straw is in there and the, and the toilet effluent is in there. And uh, what we have is a very archaic system in Burlington, which is called combined system. So everything from the street, which isn't only rainwater, it's also uh, tire refuse and oil and gasoline, uh, whatever, you know, is mixed with what comes out of your toilet. You can say, well, that, okay, that's organic. But anyway, that's mixed so that when it does rain, the, the system is overtaxed. The right. peak can't be de dealt with, so it just dumps it into the lake. Right. And we haven't even gotten to the point of settling that, let alone going on to the next level, which is tertiary treatment. Mm -hmm. Tertiary treatment mm -hmm. means dealing with the phar pharmaceuticals that can affect your endocrine system, that can affect your, uh, your, your body in many, many ways. And here we have a hospital. We have uh, people so, taking more and more drugs. So, so what's happening with those pharmaceuticals right now? Just well, you get the three-legged frog. You know, you get all the, the consequences. And there's some science pointing there's some to science, that. There's so some yeah. extra pharmaceuticals yeah, in the Yeah, it's Champlain, going right, right in. And, and even caffeine becomes quite a, an issue right, um, right. as it goes into the water. So none of that is filtered out or, or chemically removed. So that, that's what we should be focusing, I think, our money on. And... and uh, um, so then all of these issues that, that um, people, uh, not, just, not just you guys, right, but lots of people have uh, voiced with this project. Um, how does the report or the fair development assessment tool that really was spoken about, um, which you brought with you, um, mm -hmm. we, we really released it yesterday. Um, we kind of sprung it on a lot of people. Um, I'll take that just for a second. This is, here we go. So this is, was the event that we had yesterday, and um, we really wanted to get the community involved with, uh, with what we've been working on, and this was a report that we put together based off of uh, an assessment that uh, they designed in, in, in Baltimore for, for some development there. Um, we're, we're trying to develop something that we can do that's going to be personally used in Burlington um, for this project um, that's also added on to Plan BTV, um, something so that we can mold it around the biggest project that maybe ever could happen in the state for now and, and be able to transfer it to other communities. So when we, when we did this, we released it, we released it to everybody and we were actually looking for feedback. And, and so that's what I, I really like. You have some parts highlighted. That's what we were looking for. We were looking for people to tell us what they really thought about how this could be used to solve maybe some of these issues, right, that, mm -hmm. that you know, we didn't focus on. And in this report, um, we focused a lot on the, um, the kind of human rights aspect of things and not necessarily on the environmental impacts, mm -hmm. um, which was really interesting. So. Um, just it, let's go for it. Um, I, I don't know. I think we got maybe five minutes left or, okay. or 10 minutes. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll be really quick. Uh, so definitely w one of the things, um, I, I thought it was a great tool. It was, it's definitely, uh, as, as it's designed it, it, it definitely takes, as I said earlier, it takes a look in, compares, uh, Taking a look at the Baltimore, the original Baltimore plan, yeah. uh, and seeing how this one was crafted, I the, there uh, an incredible job was done on it. 
Uh, I also think that it was really cool how they really did, you know, they juxtapose what's happening now, the, the policy issues that we're currently facing, and the methodology to go forward in the plans. However, I do think that one thing that is lacking alongside the environmental, um, more, more like the, envi the, the environmental um, st stances on environmental issues, mm -hmm. is stances on direct planning and building. And I'm, I'm, not, j I'm not just talking about how high we're going to, you know, build the buildings with zoning codes. I'm talking, mm -hmm. are we going to help mitigate the wastewater system by, uh, by you know, building permeable pavements and turning our streets into uh, poor surfaces that can then absorb uh, rainwater or you know, snow melt and it'll filter into the ground before it reaches Lake Champlain. That puts a lot of less uh, stress on the, the, the old piping system as well as the new, pipe, uh, new systems that will have to be you know, retrofitted uh, during the development process, which are, there hasn't been a comprehensive uh, water quality uh, uh, assessment done on this for anyone to know whether the retrofitting system is going to work or not. So that's another issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, they, they, so they're, so wor working on like actual develop, developmental fundamental uh, planning rules and templates would, uh, I, think, I think would definitely make it stronger as well. To, to add to what we have, yeah. Right, to add to, add to what we have, but okay. I think it's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any any other any other suggestions? Uh, well, uh, I like I like the uh, emphasis on on transparency and and public participation. And we've talked before about the neighborhood planning assemblies. Right. I, I think uh, you know that's reference, and I think that uh, what we need to do is beef those up. Those date from Bernie's time, and uh, what they don't have is a mandate that all large development projects have to come before the. Uh, neighborhood planning assemblies hmm. doesn't mean that they would have a veto power, but they should be able to perhaps issue an opinion or, or certainly uh, uh, quiz the developer in terms of the ins and outs of, of that particular project. Now it's discretionary, and so people bring their projects when they're trying to cultivate public support, but when they don't feel they need it, they, they ignore it. So Burlington has these uh, NPAs, neighborhood planning um, yeah. Associations? Associations. Uh, assemblies. Assemblies. Yeah. Neighborhood planning assemblies. Um, so even communities that may not have those hopefully could use this tool maybe on an online forum on a front porch. They, they could uh, do that. Uh, sure. Front porch sure. forum type sure. of thing or uh, something that, that everybody could convene around to to help to help the, the idea of an NPA be existing, you know, in your town where maybe people don't live so closely or something like that. Yeah, New York City has about 50 of them, and I think that was the model. And again, they, you know, they have to look at every piece of public property that's going to be uh, disposed of, and they have to look at very large projects. So uh, again, they don't veto, but they at least offer an opinion. So it's a it's a it's a kind of a courtroom for a developer to say, well, this is why it's a good project and why you should support it. So looking at all types of projects, not just no public and private. Sure. Yeah, public yeah, right. And, and so not just the one project in uh, Burlington, the one big project, right? But no, the one I was involved with, with was in Greenwich Village, and uh, of course Greenwich Village is being uh, cannibalized by New York University. So there was a whole series of. Of, 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 and it, this continues of uh, land grabs and uh, very dense development projects, which uh, um, I think it was good that the, the, that they had to come to the NPA, and sometimes they were that was enough uh, effort to start to stop a project. Yeah, cool. Can I just jump on that really quick? Uh, uh, well, I just wanted to give you a second. I'll oh, go ahead, Jeff. Okay, all right. Sure. Yeah. Uh, inter inter interestingly enough, uh, since this was uh, our version was based on you know the, the Baltimore uh, plan that's exactly what John Hopkins has been doing in Baltimore itself okay. uh, they've been, they've been land grabbing all of the uh, project in poor housing poor, poor neighbor economically disadvantaged neighborhoods in the area and turning it into housing for their faculty that mm. don't really move in to the area because they live elsewhere and the rent is still very high for them and so it's a uh, that, that's also something that we would want to address. So it's a pattern. I mm -hmm. think it's a, we have a, an international university that's located in a particular city, but it doesn't really feel a part of that city. So it just simply co-ops the cheapest 
real estate it can. And uh, I think Yale has the same relationship to New Haven. Mm -hmm. Uh, from, what, from what I have heard is in Chicago, is it uh, Ram Emanuel um, Mayor there, if I have the name correct? Uh, they have tax incre increment financing, TIF, which is what we're voting on. And I'd love to tell you what my vote is, but uh, other people can say they're voting yes. Uh, other people are unable to say. Myself, I can't say when I'm voting. Um, but um, you can it's go to my post. Chicago. So Chicago. Um, they're using tax increment financing yeah. um, to build a school uh, with, that, with that money. And uh, th we don't have a school in our downtown district, but they're tweaking this thing so much. Well, how about it? Uh, I've heard other residents say this. Well, how about um, a $20 million uh, department of uh, environmental department for the high school or something? in the downtown. So that money goes towards schools instead of like like a like a like a school in this town oh. center. It's just a thought. Instead for, of fancy patios for, for shoppers. For, for the kids? Yes. Interesting. Um, I kinda like that idea myself, uh, personally. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, um, so I just wanted to make sure that I, I got it out there that rights and democracy really really is uh, pro voting and we're not going to get another chance to um, do another show so please go out and vote on November 8th um, voice your opinion uh, whatever that may be on whatever you know education that you're you're looking at whatever uh, whatever influences you have so um, are are you guys all planning on on going out and participating in the process absolutely voting, yeah yeah Absolutely, yeah. Well, yeah, that's great. certainly locally and also, of course, nationally. And uh, have you noticed uh, anything about uh, your communities? Any more involvement this year than there has been in the past? My vote is currently in Virginia in a very gerrymandered area, and so I'm definitely getting uh, my absentee ballots already been sent. It's on the way, mm -hmm. and so <laughs> I had to call them up and make sure that they had actually sent it. It was a little mm -hmm. bit of a delay. In there. Yeah, no, that's smart. That's smart. Follow good follow up. The yeah, CLC was also signing up, uh, uh, st uh, particularly students, but also other people who have just moved to the community, mm -hmm. and and giving them the paperwork to to reassign their uh, their voter address. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so what is it? Uh, it's coming right up to the cutoff line. Is pretty soon. Um, November second at five p.m. I think. November second is when you have to register by so that you can vote on November 8th. So, so please get out there and do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any last words, anybody, for, these, yeah, for the show this month? Did you have a good time? Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Black Lives Matter. Thanks for having Great me. Great time. Yeah. Jeff, Black good to matter. meet you. Thanks, Pleasure everybody, well. for watching.